The constitutional crisis of 1993 was a political standoff between the Russian president Boris Yeltsin and the Russian parliament that was resolved by using military force. The relations between the president and the parliament had been deteriorating for some time. The constitutional crisis reached a tipping point on September 21, 1993, when President Yeltsin aimed to dissolve the country's legislature, although the president did not have the power to dissolve the parliament according to the constitution. Yeltsin used the results of the referendum of April 1993 to justify his actions. In response, the parliament declared that the president's decision was null and void, impeached Yeltsin and proclaimed Vice President Alexander Rutskoy to be acting president. The situation deteriorated at the beginning of October. On October 3, demonstrators removed police cordons around the parliament and, urged by their leaders, took over the mayor's offices and tried to storm the Ostankino Television Center. The army, which had initially declared its neutrality, stormed the Supreme Soviet building in the early morning hours of October 4 by Yeltsin's order, and arrested the leaders of the resistance. The 10-day conflict became the deadliest single event of street fighting in Moscow's history since the revolutions of 1917. According to government estimates, 187 people were killed and 437 wounded, while estimates from non-governmental sources put the death toll at as high as 2,000. Origins Intensifying executive legislative power struggle Yeltsin's economic reform program took effect on January 2, 1992. Soon afterward prices skyrocketed, government spending was slashed, and heavy new taxes went into effect. A deep credit crunch shut down many industries and brought about a protracted depression. Certain politicians quickly began to distance themselves from the program, and increasingly, the ensuing political confrontation between Yeltsin on the one side, and the opposition to radical economic reform on the other, became centered in the two branches of government. Throughout 1992, opposition to Yeltsin's reform policies grew stronger and more intractable among bureaucrats concerned about the condition of Russian industry and among regional leaders who wanted more independence from Moscow. Russia's vice president, Alexander Rutskoy, denounced the Yeltsin program as economic genocide. Indeed, during the first half of the year 1992, the average income of the population declined to minus 2.5 times. Leaders of oil-rich republics such as Tatarstan and Bashkiria called for full independence from Russia. Also throughout 1992, Yeltsin wrestled with the Supreme Soviet and the Russian Congress of People's Deputies for control over government and government policy. In 1992 the Speaker of the Russian Supreme Soviet, Ruslan Kazbulatov, came out in opposition to the reforms. Despite claiming to support Yeltsin's overall goals, the president was concerned about the terms of the constitutional amendments passed in late 1991, which meant that his special powers of decree were set to expire by the end of 1992. Yeltsin, awaiting implementation of his privatization program, demanded that parliament reinstate his decree powers. But in the Russian Congress of People's Deputies and in the Supreme Soviet, the deputies refused to adopt a new constitution that would enshrine the scope of presidential powers demanded by Yeltsin into law. Seventh Congress of People's Deputies During its December session the parliament clashed with Yeltsin on a number of issues and the conflict came to a head on December 9 when the parliament refused to confirm Yegor Gaida, the widely unpopular architect of Russia's shock therapy market liberalizations, as prime minister. The parliament refused to nominate Gaida, demanding modifications of the economic program and directed the central bank, which was under the parliament's control, to continue issuing credits to enterprises to keep them from shutting down. In an angry speech the next day on December 10, Yeltsin accused the Congress of blocking the government's reforms and suggested the people decide on a referendum, which course do the citizens of Russia support. 
the course of the President, a course of transformations, or the course of the Congress, the Supreme Soviet, and its chairman, a course towards folding up reforms, and ultimately towards the deepening of the crisis, Parliament responded by voting to take control of the Parliamentary Army. On December 12, Yeltsin and Parliament Speaker Kaspulatov agreed on a compromise that included the following provisions. A national referendum on framing a new Russian constitution to be held in April 1993. Most of Yeltsin's emergency powers were extended until the referendum. The parliament asserted its right to nominate and vote on its own choices for prime minister, and the parliament asserted its right to reject the president's choices to head the defense, foreign affairs, interior, and security ministries. Yeltsin nominated Viktor Chernomyrdin to be Prime Minister on December 14, and the Parliament confirmed him. Yeltsin's December 1992 compromise with the 7th Congress of the People's Deputies temporarily backfired. Early 1993 saw increasing tension between Yeltsin and the Parliament over the language of the referendum in power sharing. In a series of collisions over policy, the Congress whittled away the President's extraordinary powers, which it had granted him in late 1991. The legislature, marshaled by Speaker Ruslan Kasbulatov, began to sense that it could block and even defeat the president. The tactic that it adopted was gradually to erode presidential control over the government. In response, the president called a referendum on a constitution for April 11. Eighth Congress The Eighth Congress of People's Deputies opened on March 10, 1993 with a strong attack on the president by Kasbulatov who accused Yeltsin of acting unconstitutionally. In mid-March, an emergency session of the Congress of People's Deputies voted to amend the Constitution, strip Yeltsin of many of his powers, and cancel the scheduled April referendum, again opening the door to legislation that would shift the balance of power away from the president. The president stalked out of the Congress. Vladimir Shumiko, first deputy prime minister, declared that the referendum would go ahead, but on April 25, the parliament was gradually expanding its influence over the government. On March 16, the president signed a decree that conferred cabinet rank on Viktor Jereshchenko, chairman of the central bank, and three other officials. This was in accordance with the decision of the 8th Congress that these officials should be members of the government. The Congress, a ruling, however, had made it clear that as ministers they would continue to be subordinate to Parliament. In general, the Parliament's lawmaking activity decreased in 1993, as its agenda increasingly became to be dominated by efforts to increase the parliamentarian powers and reduce those of the President. Special regime. The President's response was dramatic. On March 20, Yeltsin addressed the nation directly on television, declaring that he had signed a decree on a special regime, under which he would assume extraordinary executive power pending the results of a referendum on the timing of new legislative elections, on a new constitution, and on public confidence in the president and vice president. Yeltsin also bitterly attacked the parliament, accusing the deputies of trying to restore the Soviet era order. Soon after Yeltsin's televised address, Valery Zorkin, Yuri Voronin, Alexander Rutskoy, and Valentin Stepankov made an address publicly condemning Yeltsin's declaration as unconstitutional. On March 23, though not yet possessing the signed document, the Constitutional Court ruled that some of the measures proposed in Yeltsin's TV address were unconstitutional. However, the decree itself, that was only published a few days later, did not contain unconstitutional steps. Ninth Congress The Ninth Congress, which opened on March 26, began with an extraordinary session of the Congress of People's Deputies taking up discussions of emergency measures to defend the Constitution, including impeachment of President Yeltsin. Yeltsin conceded that he had made mistakes and reached out to swing voters in Parliament. 
Yeltsin narrowly survived an impeachment vote on March 28, votes for impeachment falling 72 short of the 689 votes needed for a two-thirds majority. The similar proposal to dismiss Rosling Kasbulatov, the chairman of the Supreme Soviet was defeated by a wider margin. Though 614 deputies had initially been in favor of including the re-election of the chairman in the agenda, a telltale sign of the weakness of Kasbulatov's own positions. By the time of the Ninth Congress, the legislative branch was dominated by the Russian unity bloc, which included representatives of the CPRF and the Fatherland Faction, Agrarian Union, and the Faction, Russia, led by Sergei Babirin. Together with more centrist groups, the Yeltsin supporters were clearly left in the minority. National referendum The referendum would go ahead, but since the impeachment vote failed, the Congress of People's Deputies sought to set new terms for a popular referendum. The legislature's version of the referendum asked whether citizens had confidence in Yeltsin, approved of his reforms, and supported early presidential and legislative elections. The parliament voted that in order to win, the president would need to obtain 50% of the whole electorate, rather than 50% of those actually voting, to avoid an early presidential election. This time, the constitutional court supported Yeltsin and ruled that the president required only a simple majority on two issues confidence in him, and economic and social policy, he would need the support of half the electorate in order to call new parliamentary and presidential elections. On April 25, a majority of voters expressed confidence in the president and called for new legislative elections. Yeltsin termed the results a mandate for him to continue in power. Before the referendum, Yeltsin had promised to resign if the electorate failed to express confidence in his policies. Although this permitted the president to declare that the population supported him, not the parliament, Yeltsin lacked a constitutional mechanism to implement his victory. As before, the president had to appeal to the people over the heads of the legislature. On 1 May, anti-government protests organized by the hardline opposition turned violent. Numerous deputies of the Supreme Soviet took part in organizing the protest and in its course. One OMON police officer suffered fatal injuries during the riot. As a reaction, a number of the representatives of St. Petersburg Intelligentsia sent a petition to President Yeltsin, urging, putting an end to the street criminality under political slogans. Constitutional Convention on April 29, 1993 Boris Yeltsin released the text of his proposed constitution to a meeting of government ministers and leaders of the republics and regions, according to Atatas. On 12 May Yeltsin called for a special assembly of the Federation Council, which had been formed July 17, 1990 within the office of the chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the Russian SFSR, and other representatives including political leaders from a wide range of government institutions, regions, public organizations, and political parties, to finalize a draft for a new constitution from June 5 to 10, and was followed by a similar decree the 21st of May. After much hesitation, the Constitutional Committee of the Congress of People's Deputies decided to participate and present its own draft constitution. Of course, the two main drafts contained contrary views of legislative-executive relations. Some 700 representatives at the conference ultimately adopted a draft constitution on July 12 that envisaged a bicameral legislature and the dissolution of the Congress. But because the convention's draft of the Constitution would dissolve the Congress, there was little likelihood that the Congress would vote itself out of existence. The Supreme Soviet immediately rejected the draft and declared that the Congress of People's Deputies was the supreme lawmaking body and hence would 
decide on a new constitution. July-September The Parliament was active in July, while the President was on vacation, and passed a number of decrees that revised economic policy in order to end the division of society. It also launched investigations of key advisers of the President, accusing them of corruption. The President returned in August and declared that he would deploy all means, including circumventing the Constitution, to achieve new parliamentary elections. In July, the Constitutional Court of the Russian Federation confirmed the election of Pyotr Suman to head the administration of the Chelyabinsk Oblast, something that Yeltsin had refused to accept. As a result, a situation of dual power existed in that region from July to October in 1993, with two administrations claiming legitimacy simultaneously. Another conflict involved the decision of the Constitutional Court of the Russian Federation regarding the regional presidency in Mordovia. The court delegated the question of legality of abolishing the post of the region's president to the Constitutional Court of Mordovia. As a result, popularly elected President Vasily Guslianikov, member of the pro-Yeltsin Democratic Russia movement, lost his position. Thereafter, the state news agency ceased to report on a number of constitutional court decisions. The Supreme Soviet also tried to further foreign policies that differed from Yeltsin's line. Thus, on July 9, 1993, it passed a resolution on Sevastopol, confirming the Russian federal status of the city. Ukraine saw its territorial integrity at stake and filed a complaint to the Security Council of the UN. Yeltsin condemned the resolution of the Supreme Soviet. In August 1993, a commentator reflected on the situation as follows. The president issues decrees as if there were no Supreme Soviet, and the Supreme Soviet suspends decrees as if there were no president. The president launched his offensive on September 1st when he attempted to suspend Vice President Rutskoy, a key adversary. Rutskoy, elected on the same ticket as Yeltsin in 1991, was the president's automatic successor. A presidential spokesman said that he had been suspended because of accusations of corruption. On September 3, the Supreme Soviet rejected Yeltsin's suspension of Rutskoy and referred the question to the Constitutional Court. Two weeks later Yeltsin declared that he would agree to call early presidential elections provided that the parliament also called elections. The parliament ignored him. On September 18, Yeltsin then named Yegor Gader, who had been forced out of office by parliamentary opposition in 1992, a deputy prime minister and a deputy premier for economic affairs. This appointment was unacceptable to the Supreme Soviet, which emphatically rejected it.